Yeah, no, it's all. Might as well be on time. Did you? Yeah. That one. Uh, well, I'll, yeah, I'll be fine from this one. That's think, on, I think. I think we're on. Good. So good. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming out on a, a rather cold and frosty evening. Uh, it's, it's a bit parky in here. Um, so, but hopefully uh, we'll, we'll warm it up just through our sheer presence and also for the enjoyment of John's talk to come. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor John McDermott uh, to give this talk. This is part of our, it's our last, in fact, of our, our 50th anniversary celebrations. This is the, the Computer Science Department's 50th year. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have John uh, giving this last talk. Um, because in many ways he's a significant part of the history of the department. Uh, having joined it in 1987, and we were just discussing whether or not he's possibly the oldest member of the department still here. Um, we, we think he's got a, got a close second to Alan Burns, but we're not quite sure. Um, mm. uh, but obviously a significant part of the history of the department because he's also been uh, head of department twice, uh, as if once wasn't enough. Um, <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> I, I couldn't possibly say. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but also, you know, sort of uh, make significant uh, sort of shapes in, in, for what the department has become. So um, most notably with the, the CPD and work around safety and the development of the MSc uh, in safety critical software engineering, which is a, one of the core offerings of the department. Uh, but has also shaped the, the sort of the research and direction of the department, which has now become the, a core part of the strategy is safety. Uh, when we think about safe, ethical and secure computational systems, which is our vision uh, as a department. Uh, and uh, John doesn't seem to sort of ever rest. Uh, if those of you who work with him will know, know this, Anna's shaking her head. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and even sort of like sometimes you think, oh, perhaps John's sort of slowing down, at which point he suddenly finds uh, 10 million pounds down the back of a sofa and persuaded a uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation to fund, I think, one of the most exciting projects in the university at this time, which is the Assuring Autonomy International Programme. Uh, which I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about uh, uh, later, of which John's the director. And, and it's this sort of energy uh, and enthusiasm for, for safety, which could be considered a, a rather unglamorous uh, um, uh, area. Um, if you th anybody think of health and safety, we tend not to think of that as being exciting, but I think you can see from that there is huge excitement around this area. Uh, and particularly now that we're going into the area of autonomy, uh, it becomes something which could be, have a, a huge impact on all of us in whole sorts of ways through our lives. Um, so it's at that point, I think it's sensible for me to stop talking and let the expert talk about these things. Uh, so it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome John uh, and say thank you all for coming and we'll look forward to your talk, John. Thank you. Okay. Paul, thank you uh, very much. So, Paul, thank you very much and, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So the, the slide says 50 years of computer science at, at York. I must admit the first paper I wrote about a computer was in 1971 which is slightly over 50 years ago, but that was about the school computer that I helped build rather than um, here. Um, Paul has mentioned that the sort of re research um, ethos of the department is around safe, ethical, and secure computing. I'm going to talk about that, but actually say a little bit about robotics and autonomous systems, which is where um, my current research focus is. So I'm going to try to do say a little bit more about um, history of, of these sorts of systems, including a, a cautionary tale which leads me into the interest in safety. Say a little bit about automation versus autonomy, and then say a little bit about how we produce um, autonomous systems and robots that are safe. But I, I want to talk about the, the challenges. The challenges are more interesting than the solutions, but say a little bit about solutions as, as well. Um, talk a little bit about um, Ethics, the, the second word in the title, then go and link um, safety and security before drawing some conclusions. Um, so hopefully I shall keep this to a reasonable time so there's time for questions. I know of at least one difficult one coming up. So is that a selective history? You know, we think of autonomy as being recent. Well, in 1495, Leonardo da Vinci designed this um, autonomous car, basically a clockwork mechanism that would mean it could drive it itself. We talk about autonomous road vehicles, and so um, this so-called Phantom Auto was operated in the United States in New York in 1925. It didn't drive itself, but it was driven by remote control using this newfangled stuff called um, radio. And, and the, you can see upon that picture that that's actually where the aerial is on the car, so you could transmit commands to it. It didn't last very long. It was tried in a few other places, but um, you know, uh, perhaps ahead of its time. So I talk about the cautionary tale. In fact, this was the 
first safety related system that, that I worked in uh, right about uh, 40 years ago before I um, came to York. And, and so in um, various areas in hospitals, they used um, syringe pumps. So these are pumps that will deliver um, fluids um, to um, humans. It, it might be anesthetics, it might be medicine. What they normally do is they're set up to deliver fluids very slowly um, over a long um, period of time. So in this particular case, I shall try to um, demonstrate, and unfortunately, um, some systems went badly wrong. And let me see if my props work. So um, big syringe, quarter of a litre. And what it did was that, as fast as the motor could push it, um, unfortunately to somebody's arm. And that happened twice. First time they said, oh, that was a bit strange. And second time um, they came to the conclusion there was a systematic problem, um, which there was. And this was um, an interaction between software and the hardware, the sensor electronics, which were at the limit of their manufacturing range. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a, in a moment. But also there was a change in the software. And it's a combination of these <coughs> characteristics led to the problem. So, what safety people like me do is try to understand how such accidents could occur to help people modify the design to avoid the problem or to make them acceptably unlikely. So let me try to explain a little bit more about how this um, came about. Um, so I'm going to have another prop courtesy of, of, of Pete Cooper who has worked in the department um, longer than me. So there's a, a sensor that detects whether or not the motor that drives the syringe is turning or not. And so there's some pictures there, but it's easier to, to show you courtesy of Pete's little prop. Um, so there's a, a reference signal like this, a square wave um, in the system. And then the sensor generates a square wave. And if I can actually manage to slide it in. So if the square wave lines up like that, then it's not moving. But if the one from the sensor is in that direction, it's turning one way, in that direction, it's turning the other. So you just measure the relative position of the, the edges and actually how far away they are actually tells you how fast it's going. Unfortunately, with this particular device, because of the way the electronics were, the signals, whoops, it's not in quite straight, the signals that came out weren't quite like that. They were like this. So to the people who understand their electronics, it was a much smaller mark space ratio. So if it moved one way or the other, it still stayed inside the reference signal. And so the logic said, it's not moving. Um, so because these, these sensors, the electronic folk amongst you, they're Schmidt triggers, and they just produce very narrow signals. It stayed inside the reference signal. And so the logic said, um, it's, it's not moving, um, and the motor kept going. And I'll say a little bit more about how that happened in, in a moment. But I think what safety people try to do is to analyze these sorts of systems and understand how they work uh, and, and how they can go wrong. Um, so for the sorts of autonomous systems we're interested in, we have a, a, a very simple sort of system model here that uh, the system senses the environment, senses the world, and the different pictures may, may it be, you know, it may be hearing, it may be um, through cameras or whatever. Um, it understands what's going on in the world. It makes a decision, acts, that act influences the world, and it goes through that um, loop uh, again. So um, in a robot or autonomous system, um, it may need to sense its own state. So in the case of the syringe pump, sensing the movement um, of the motor as, as well as sensing the environment. Um, modern systems use um, machine learning and, and some of the previous uh, talks you've had have talked about some machine learning. But I'll say a little bit about that from a safety perspective later on to help understand what's happening and to make decisions. And the picture also talks about traditional understanding and traditional deciding. So there may be other mechanisms that are programmed there as well. So let me come back to this um, syringe pump thinking about the sensing element, the rotation of the motor driving the syringe um, pump, the syringe plunger, was meant to be sensed. 
But the sensor was an outlier in terms of manufacturing. Uh, one of the things I haven't said is, actually they made 100,000 of these, and two of those 100,000 failed. So it was actually um, a rare uh, case, uh, extreme in the manufacturing um, condition of, of these parts. So the sensor didn't detect any movement. So the understanding, traditional code, no, no machine learning in this, is that the plunger wasn't moving. The solution was to keep trying, keep getting it to move. So the act was continuing to supply current to the motor, which kept turning. So I say, safety engineering is concerned with trying to avoid such things if possible, but where it's not possible to avoid them entirely is to control them to make them less likely or, or to mitigate them. So one thing to do would be to have a second way of detecting the movement or just count, hey, I've been trying to make this thing move for a period of time. It doesn't seem to be moving. There must be a problem. I'll switch it off and sound an alarm. Um, I mentioned earlier that there'd been um, a change in the software. Um, it was an unfortunate change. There was a second mechanism for detecting movement, um, but it was triggering lots of false alarms and stopping the pumps. So they said, we'll change the software. We'll wait until this first mechanism decides the pump's moving and then turn on the second one. So that was part of the cause. Interestingly, of, of the systems I've looked at where software has been a causal factor in accident, about 50% of the time there's been a change that hasn't been fully understood. So this is, you know, 40 years ago, quite a simple system, not very much code. Let's move forward about 20 years. This is around about turn of the century, now, um, to the millennium. So this is the structure of a, a, a piece of software. Um, those of you who've seen this before might remember this is an aircraft engine controller. Of, of course, you can tell, right? Um, but for those of you that don't, it says there's modules. So modules, you know, are small pieces of code. You know, it may only be, you know, one or two sheets of, uh, of, of paper if you typed it all out, written by uh, a single software engineer, and there's dependencies between these different modules. So it's an aircraft engine controller, so one of these things may say, this is the air pressure at this point in the engine, and something else that needs that information will depend on it. So there's connections between all of those. This is conventional programming written by human beings. Human intelligible? It, it is. It, it's complicated. This is about 100 person years worth of, of, of software, so it's big but not gargantuan. Um, fly reliably, no Rolls-Royce Aero engine controller so far, touch wood, don't tempt fate, has ever failed in such a way that's lost an aircraft. Um, so it's expensive, it takes a lot of effort, more than half of the effort goes in verification, proving its correctness and safety, um, but it can be done. So 20 years ago, thereabouts. So let me move forward a bit to um, automation or autonomy, which is where robots and things like this um, come in. Um, so what do I mean by automation? This is something that's routine or repetitious, um, tasks that are done in predefined scenarios or predefined conditions. So imagine an electric kettle that switches itself off when the water's um, boiling. I'd say that's automation, it's automatic. But if it's autonomous, it's more sophisticated, it's more flexible, it governs itself, it has some freedom from external controller influence, it can change what it does to an extent. So a robot vacuum cleaner, um, the one shown on the bottom is more realistic, you can buy those, the one on the far, far side um, looks much more exciting, but as far as I know it's um, just a, a demonstration system, you can't actually buy them. But actually these are adaptive. Um, if you move the furniture, um, they will recalculate their route um, round the, the room. Um, or if there's a cat, it will try not to run over the cat and to, to clean that um, uh, as, as well. Um, but another example might be um, a water sprayer, and I'll explain some of what's here in, in a moment. So this little um, gadget, actually not that little, um, is... Um, produced by a company called, called Caterpillar. Um, th this guy is in a, in, in a mine um, in, in Australia um, somewhere. 
to give an idea of, of, of scale, just, just look at the ladder, but th this contains 160,000 litres of water. So the water is 160 tonnes, um, and the whole thing probably weighs 200 tonnes. It's got a very, very simple job. It detects if it's very low humidity and it's very dusty, and then goes and sprays the roads to keep the dust down. But completely autonomously, it just says, hey, it's a bit too dry and dusty, and puddles off. Um, after a while, it goes, oh dear, I'm out of water, and it goes back to the tap and fills itself up again, and off it goes. So this 200 ton monster, um, you know, rushes around um, by itself, actually goes quite slowly. But so, so to me, this is um, autonomous. But, but, but let me try to um, set that apart a little bit more. So I'd say, you know, it's not autonomous if the users um, control every action, they initiate it, they mediate it, they control it. If the environment changes, then you need to make explicit redesign, reprogramming. And the capabilities are static once the thing is in operation. Um, it's autonomous if the user set the mission um, and the system does the, the rest. So, you know, in this particular case, it was designed to do this spraying task. It's taken to the, to the mine and left to get on uh, with its job by itself. It adapts to changes in the environment. It becomes dustier, drier. They change the road layout in the, um, in the mine and it adapts to that. And in some cases, the system will also change, will learn, uh, improve it in operation. Well, if you think of the, ro the robot vacuum um, cleaner, um, certainly it does you know, set mission and the system does the rest and adapts to change the environment. The same is true of, of the water sprayer as well. They may or may not change in operation. They probably don't. So right, it's a spectrum, but to me, these are more autonomous than automated or, or automatic. Um, from a safety perspective, autonomy is where some of the challenges um, really are. But I'll, I'll come on to that um, in just a moment. So I'll say a little bit more um, about safety of these sorts of autonomous systems and, and robots. But I'm going to start um, with some challenges. I'll say they're much more interesting than the s s solutions. But, uh, what autonomous systems do is they transfer decision making from human beings to the machine, which I say might be conventional, but it might use arti artificial intelligence or machine learning. The way machine, machine learning works is the system learns its future, future behavior by generalizing from training data. Uh, so, you know, with the um, water sprayer, it will have been taken around the mine to understand the layout, but when that changes, it, it adapts to those changes. Now, when we're moving decisions from people to machines, what we have to realize is, actually, human beings are pretty amazing. We know a lot. We have semantic models. We know what a bicycle is. We know what its likely behavior is. We know what a shadow is. Why do I say shadow? Well, um, this little picture comes from a standard on autonomous um, driving. Um, it's photoshopped, of course, but the idea is you put this uh, picture of a girl on the road with a ball and people will slow down because they don't want to hit a child. It doesn't take you very long to realize, of course, it's photoshopped because the cars have shadows and she doesn't. Um, but a machine learning model might not necessarily know that. And again, we have contextual models that the machines don't have. Now, this example in the standard is, uh, is, is faked, um, but this next picture is, is sort of real. Actually, this is a London bus, and what happened wasn't in London. It's a different um, city in the UK, but a um, company building um, autonomous road vehicles suddenly had it screeched to a halt in front of the bus um, because there were life-size pictures of people on the side of the bus. The logic goes, oh, pedestrians, they're in my way. I should stop. Doesn't do that now. They've added some more criteria. But it's the algorithms learned to detect people, and these look like people. Um, and you, know, you and I wouldn't be fooled by that. Of course, there's an advert on the side of the bus. But they don't know that. So actually training these things to make them effective and safe is extraordinarily difficult. Um, and, and let me give you... Um, one more example, um, which I hope is helpful to understand some of the problems. Uh, one of the great things about Teslas is they keep doing 
um, crazy things. Um, but the people who own them like taking videos and taking pictures of what they're doing. So you can have a, have a look at that and, and see what goes wrong. So um, the, the picture here is, is somewhere in, in California. I can't quite remember where. And to the right of the driver is, is the screen telling the driver um, what the car um, is assessing about the road and, and what's going on. So if you see in this, you can see there's some, some red lines, and, and this is the car saying, well, actually, that's the edge of the road. Um, I shouldn't go there. What the car does is it calculates what it calls a drivable area. Wh where are the places I can drive? And the red lines delimit that. But if you, if you look at the picture on the left, this is a bit of an optical um, illusion. It, it looks like the road narrows, and partly because of where the car is, it actually looks as if you run out of road. Of course, you know, to a normal human being, you say, well, of course, there's road behind the car. It just goes, it goes around like that. Um, but the Tesla decided that there was no drivable area, and if it carried on, it would hit the trees. So it made a decision that the autopilot disengaged because it perceived a risk of collision, um, leaving road, leaving road, of collision with the trees. And so the action that was taken was um, a hard stop emergency braking. So if you think about the sense, understand, decide app model, the sensors were fine, uh, nothing wrong with those, but the, the understanding through the ML model was it decided it had no drivable area. Um, if there's no drivable area, then the right decision is, is to stop. Um, so uh, you've got these very complex things, trying to work out how the sensors and the associated machine learning models will build an understanding of the real world. So let me extend from these challenges into safety. Um, what the safety process does, as Paul rightly says, is normally very boring. We sort of say, well, you know, what's the system meant to do? What happens when it goes wrong, um, roughly? But what we do is start by saying, well, actually, where is the system? What's its boundary? And we also assume that boundary is fixed, because it normally is. Um, what we then do is say we actually know we can specify sufficiently precisely um, the system behavior. It doesn't have to be absolutely precise, but precisely enough. We know enough about the environment to assess what are caused, called hazards. These are situations that can arise that would give rise to harm if they were not properly controlled. And also the development slowly adds detail so we can analyze it as we go. And if I go back to the engine controller um, example, although it's quite um, complex, um, you add detail so you can manage that as you go. Well, with um, AI or machine learning, that boundary um, isn't known and it, and it may change. It may be that new things appear in the environment which actually change the way the system behaves. The behavior is not precisely known. It's learned, not specified. And the models can be very opaque and I'll say more about that in a moment. And the environment is extremely complex. Actually, that's no different than it is with manually operated systems, but we can no longer rely on the human understanding of that world, and unpredictable things can occur. Uh, you know, no talk in, in York would be complete without a picture of some ducks. So, you know, it, in this case, would the machine learning decide there were passengers on the bus or not? I don't know, and maybe it doesn't make that much difference in terms of, of, of safety, but you know, the algorithms who are faced with this would make some decision, and who knows quite what. But also the development that we go through is highly iterative, and, and that makes things um, really um, quite challenging. So let me give a, just give you a, an idea. So the, the, the piece of software from engine control I showed you a while ago was quite complex. Um, but this is a tad more challenging. So one of the great things about machine learning, there, there are lots of libraries and tools whereby you can just go and download some pre-existing models to use. And th th this one, it shows you the structure of something called um, ResNet 50. It's a, um, a, a visu visual uh, processing um, module that you could use, for example, for um, visual analysis for a, for a car. Um, it has over 23 million tunable parameters buried inside um, that structure. So even if you could make them visible to human beings, there's no way you could make any sense. I was sort of printing them on here, but I decided against it. There's no way you could make um, any um, sense of, of that. 
Now, I mean, people are working on concepts such as explainability of these machine learning models that would extract a more intelligible um, representation out of these models. But it's still an active research area and it's still very difficult. So the reality is, you know, you can pick up and deploy things um, very readily, um, which are way beyond the ability of a human being to understand them. So how do we try to control this? Um, I'll explain in a moment, but I, I need to add one further um, model um, before I do. So machine learning um, development process, and this is you know, thanks to my, my colleagues in the Assuring Autonomy International Program for developing um, these models, but effectively the first bit of the process is to collect data for the problem that we're interested in, which may come from the real world, it may come from simulations. Often it comes from simulations. We process that data, extract some of it for training um, a model. Um, and when we train the model, we will then check against a part of that model if it meets the overall performance or requirements we have. And so imagine, you know, I'm driving in a city, I'd have some requirements about the probability of detecting pedestrians who might be um, in, in the way, and the closer they are, the more likely I am want to be able to detect them because I need to take some action to, to avoid them. Once the, the model passed that initial test, it goes on to a separate verification stage where I take some of the data that I collected originally but haven't used for, for training to test it to see if that's okay. Um, if those checking stages don't work, we feedback, we iterate, we try again, but when they do work, we then um, deploy the model, we put it into the physical system, the robot, uh, or whatever it, ever it is, and go and use it. And inside the rectangle at the bottom, I would have my sense, understand, decide, act. Rather than showing that again, there's a, a picture here of a, of a small uh, marine vessel, um, a, a tug, which as far as I know was the, the first autonomous maritime um, operation there was, and this was done by, by Rolls-Royce in, uh, in Harbour in Copenhagen uh, a few years ago. Now, um, I, I've, I've talked about machine learning and how it works. I, I want to try to illustrate for you sort of graphically um, almost machine learning. So I'll, I'll play this video um, in, in just a moment. So video from um, a, a film. Uh, this is a film called, called Starman. Uh, and so this guy is an alien um, who's, um, and you'll see a lady in a, in a moment in, in the car. Um, her husband died and he's taken on the form of, of her dead husband, which is a bit worrying, but never mind. Um, and he doesn't know anything about the earth, he doesn't know anything about driving, um, but he's been watching her. So he's been learning how to drive by watching her and he's now driving the car on their way across America. So let me play this, so it's, it's a bit loud, but hopefully this is okay. And there's also some subtitles. Oh my God! Look, look out, what are you doing? I do know the rules. Oh, well, for She's your information, pal, that was her. a yellow light back there. I watched you very carefully. Red light stop, green light go, yellow light go very fast. You better let me drive. I will drive. So, um, one of the things that happens in machine learning is it gets training data and it generalizes from that. So all the cases of yellow lights you see in driving through, she's gone through very, very fast so she doesn't get stopped on red. But presumably none of those, there was a truck carrying hay in the way, otherwise she presumably would have stopped. So it's generalized, all yellow lights, you go very, very fast. And that's what machine learning does. Yeah. So uh, let me... Then try, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, do it again. So, if I then talk about how we deal with safety processes for autonomy, um, actually the concepts are the same. Um, we have to worry about um, hazards, these are situations that could give rise to harm, or give rise to harm if they're not properly controlled. A risk, which is really just a combination of how likely the harm is and how severe 
the harm is, and the greater both of those are, the greater um, the risk. This idea of a, a safety case, a way of justifying that a system um, is safe enough to deploy in, in some given environment or, or context. And you know, the work we've done in York over, I don't know, approaching 30 years, um, has, has worked around safety cases, probably what we're best um, known for. So if I've got machine learning or autonomy, um, the interpretation of these concepts and the analyses we do are a bit different, um, but actually the concept is still um, pretty much um, the same. So in the hazard causes, we might have to look at inadequate or inappropriate training data. So it might not recognize an object. And so, you know, does it recognize ducks as passengers and what does it do? Um, in terms of risk, we have to think about um, uncertainty due to the complexity of the models, um, uh, particularly where they're not open to human scrutiny. Um, so it's harder to evaluate probabilities. Um, and again, I, I just want to um, show you um, a, a sort of il illustration of this, another video. So if you may be aware, there's a little um, train that goes on the road between the National Rail Museum uh, and the city centre. Uh, one of um, uh, our colleagues, um, J James um, Hil Hilder and some others, um, in instrumented um, this little train um, with a camera and fed it into some machine learning algorithms. And what you see is a, a set of stages that this vehicle um, builds up of its understanding of these images. And I'll, I'll try to explain uh, as this goes. So it starts off um, running an algorithm called YOLO. You only look once and it's identifying things in the image, um, people and so on, with a probability um, that it's a person or not. You see, the closer it gets, the probability gets much closer to 100%, which is kind of encouraging. It's more confident when it's close to these things and it's recognized them um, properly. It's just seeing individual people and not doing one. Then we add another algorithm called DeepSort, and you notice there's now um, ID, you know, ID 414, ID 518. So it's given labels to these objects so it can track them and work out their um, stretch. You decide that there's a truck here, um, and in front of it there's a person. So this is one of the problems. You may not see things. It's now detected the person who pushes out with her pram, it now detects the other person, but hasn't actually realized they're one and the same thing. So the next bit is worrying about um, hazards. It labels the, the traffic light as a risk and eventually decides it's a hazard because it's red. Maybe you wouldn't want to call it a hazard, but that's how it's labeled um, in this system. It changes to green, we're about to move off, and somebody comes across at the last minute. This is York after all, so you ignore, you ignore the signs, right? And indeed, there's a, there's a hazard. So this is what these algorithms are doing. So the notion of, of hazards and so on is still exactly the same as it, as, as it would be um, in a conventional system, but this is how these sorts of things work through this um, perception system. Um, so let me um, move on uh, from, from there and show you one thing about risk. So this, this picture is a, is a top-down image of a, of a car park. The blue rectangle is a, is a car, the so-called ego vehicle that's um, driving around the car park. The other green rectangles are other cars that it's identified um, in the car park. And then the color coding is the level of risk. So the, the 10 to minus 2 is a 1 in 100 chance of hitting something. The 10 to minus 5 is a 1 in 100,000 chance of, of hitting it. You notice there's a, so what it's done is it's calculated a set of possible trajectories around this car park and worked out the risk. And so there's a, a bunch that go between the corner of two cars, which are quite high risk because it might hit them or they might move. And the gap that it thinks is big enough turns out not to be and some of the others are much lower risk. And so this is um, really relating to the, the de deciding part, and it's saying, I'm going to work out the risk and choose a, a route that's quite quick, hence the red ones would be good because they're quick, but also I'm going to look at the risk and make a choice um, a, a accordingly. So these notions of, of hazard and risk aren't different, but there's different ways of, uh, of trying to calculate the, the, these things. So. Um, I said I'd try to explain what safety cases are. This is probably the, one of the more, more tricky bits, so hopefully you're all still um, uh, uh, awake here. So what a safety case is a way of presenting an argument in, in a structured way, supported by a body of evidence, that a system is safe enough 
for some given application in a given operating environment. So I know where I'm going to use it, I know what we're going to do with it, and I know how it works. I'm going to get some, some evidence to support that, but I've got an argument, a rationale that allows me to say why that's the case. And so here, um, this little example is just a, a fragment of the argument um, part in a notation we developed called goal structuring notation, which is now quite widely used. And they're probably the thing we're most famous for. And, you know, this top thing is, is a goal, and it says, you know, the system is safe enough to use in some particular environment. That goal is articulated in the context of a definition of the system and how it works. We, the argument is broken, that this top level goal is broken down into some sub goals, but the one in the middle says, actually I've got acceptable control over all the hazards associated with the system. There's some other things too, but we'll just focus on these hazard bits. And then um, there's a strategy below that. So I'm gonna break down this argument over all the causes I know of, of the hazards associated with the system. And so that's uh, rhetorical, it's saying, hey, trust me, this is why it's safe. It isn't um, an argument in the uh, sense of me saying something and Mark saying, no, you're wrong, uh, which of course I usually am. Um, but actually these ideas come um, from philosophy, hence philosophy in the title. So there's a, a guy called Stephen Toulmin who wrote a book called The Uses of Argument in, in 1958, where he analyzed arguments in natural language and said, they actually, they tend to have this sort of structure. Um, and we drew from that, but I say we, we got rid of things called rebuttals. These are things why, hey, here's a reason why this argument might fail. Um, I think with these more complex systems, we perhaps need to reintroduce these ideas and to, and to have more of a, 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 of a dialectical approach to developing arguments to build confidence because they're so complex, it's really hard to get this, you know, if you like, the positive proof uh, of a safety case right. So um, the other complicated bit appears here. I mean, one of the things we've developed in the Assuring Autonomy um, program is a process for safety assurance of uh, machine learning. So the process produces a, a safety case, uh, and thanks particularly to my colleague um, Richard Hawkins, but to many others who've contributed to, to this. So um, it's a, a, a six-stage process. The three in the red box in the middle, data management, model learning and model verification reflect the three stages of the um, machine learning life cycle um, I, I mentioned earlier. So we actually have to start off with some system safety requirements, um, you know, not hitting pedestrians, but actually missing them by more than a certain distance would be good as well, otherwise you're going to, to scare them. Um, having ident identified uh, system level um, requirements, I need to understand what the scope is of the machine learning components um, in, in the system. And if it's just doing object detection, um, but it's not making routing decisions, then I'm only going to have requirements here for the ML that's about detecting those pedestrians far enough away I can take avoiding action. If I'm doing route planning, then I've got to have some um, that within my scope. Having done that, I can work out um, some requirements um, on this you know, I should detect pedestrians at least 20 meters away um, and a probability of failing to do that at five meters away is blah, whatever. So work out those requirements, go through the development process, and then um, I'm going to, uh, as well as having verified them through that process, I'm going to check when I deploy this in the real physical hardware that it works. And that matters because often we do the training, the verification in simulation, and the real world will be different, you know, things will vibrate. So you won't get such a clear picture from the sensors as you do when you model them in simulation and so on and so forth. And that then produces uh, a safety case. And so my last risky bit about complicated things is that if we look at this process, you see there's a little green thing around the requirements bit. And so that's in pink. So below it, the pink is, is that step is broken down into three subparts about developing the safety requirements, um, validating them, and then putting them into the safety argument that's on the right. So here um, at the top, um, I, I've got 
something that says that I've actually got a correct set of requirements as a claim I want to make, a goal I want to demonstrate in my safety case. To do that, um, I then need to reason about the safety requirements which appear in this process, but they flow across to be part of the context in the safety argument. My um, validation results, which are here on my little process, appear over on the right-hand side in the argument. Here are the circles are, are solutions, evidence that I provide to back up that argument. Now, doing this for real, for a real system, takes a bit longer than the two and a half minutes or whatever I've spent doing that. But you know, conceptually, this is how we uh, address the safety of these, uh, of these very complex systems. So ethics and autonomy, and I don't have all that long left. I will try to leave some, some time for discussion. Let me talk about that. Again, I've got another little um, example. This, this is um, a video from one of the projects that the um, university supported. Okay, so this is, um, oh, I need a bit more volume. This is a, a robot to help Okay, I'm sending Kyra to you now. Be careful as it moves. You can adjust the hand grips so they're in a comfortable position. Hey Google, I want to adjust the position. One well, of the interesting things is this okay, is actually move the the handles. of some black box software from Google. Yeah, if it misinterprets what she's saying, what could happen? Um, hey Google, I want to adjust the position. We need to go to the end. Okay, to move the, the handles. You can hear the clicks, that's, hey, that's Google, actually moving the handle. I'm in a comfortable position. Okay, let me know when you're ready to stand and I'll count you down. Hey Google, I'm ready to stand. Okay, ready, steady, stand. What it's doing is it's helping to get up that. So the idea of, of this is to help people remain able to um, live um, independently but for many people who are old and infirm actually standing by themselves is quite hard so this gets them up and able to be mobile so this is a, a research device it's it, it's not in service um, a, a anywhere but it gives you an idea what to be done so that's a good thing isn't it well yes it is it has some benefits um, it does um, you know enhance people's lives, enable them to continue to be independent, which is actually very much a, a psychological benefit. But it could also do harm. You know, they can have injury from fall. What else the thing keeps going? You know, what, 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 what do they do? Do they fall? Do they hurt themselves? If they're elderly, um, they may suffer. Actually, if you get too much assistance, um, you may lose muscle strength, and it may actually mean in the longer run, you're worse off than if you didn't have, have this. And also it may mean, okay, you can be independent, but you're isolated. So there could be a psychological harm as well. And if you look more broadly to society, well, actually there's a benefit that's reduced demand on the social care system, which is struggling. Um, but the harm might be that actually at a later point, you get lots of people coming into the care system who have been isolated, um, who require mental health or other support. So it's not at all obvious um, what the balance is um, here, not trying to be critical of the researchers that, that develop this, but you know, there are some questions. And so what we've also been doing, and courtesy of, of Zoe Porter and other um, colleagues in the Ensuring Autonomy program, have been trying to extend the concept of safety cases to deal with um, ethics. And what we've done here is drawn on um, principles from biomedical ethics. Um, so the first of which is beneficence. So it's actually providing some sort of benefit. Non-maleficence, which is avoiding harm. This is safety, but if you think back to my previous slide, I was talking about things like you know, psychological issues as well, so it's not just the normal remit of safety, which is physical. But also the idea of, of human um, or, or, autonomy. So the human being has meaningful control over the system, which probably they do, um, given the example um, we've just seen. But the idea of justice as well is we've got the right balance between the benefits, the harms, and the degree of human autonomy, their, their ability to um, take part in something and not. And that matters for those who are affected by this. 
Um, but if we're dealing with systems that use um, complex technologies such as machine learning, then one of the important things is to have some transparency, some visibility of what's going on inside those systems to help us make sound arguments. Let me give you um, one example, which you, you may have seen in the press recently. Um, one of um, Elon Musk's companies is looking at um, brain implants to help um, blind people. Um, and, and so the picture um, on the side of the screen here is me, is of somebody wearing a pair of glasses where there's a, a camera um, on, on the glasses. And if you see in the picture of the head in the middle, there's a camera there which is collecting image data from the environment. It's processed through some AI algorithms. And if you look at the pictures at the bottom, the left-hand side is the um, image that's seen by the camera. And the right-hand side, I mean, it's, it's certainly not a, a picture-perfect representation, but it's identifying major things in the environment, such as the, the tram where the pedestrians are, um, and so on. Um, that is then transmitted wirelessly to a chip that's embedded um, in the skull. Um, um, and that interfaces to the relevant bits in the brain that actually effectively shows them where things are in the world that it might, not to, uh, might want to avoid when walking. The idea being that this is good enough to enable somebody to, to function, move around by themselves where, they're, um, where otherwise they would not be able to because of their blindness. Again, if you look at our ethical considerations, this might like, seem like quite a reasonable um, thing to do because it's up to you to decide whether to have this brain implant or not. Um, but actually, there's been a bit of controversy here because a lot of the training has been done on animals, um, including monkeys, who've had these things done, and they didn't have much choice. So there's been quite a lot of criticism um, uh, about this as well. But anyway, I'll leave that as something for you to, to, to think about. So let me turn now to... Um, security, and I'll, I'll take a narrow view of this, of sort of um, security that can influence um, safety. Um, I have another little um, e example um, here, and people say it's not safe if it's not secure, which you know, uh, is slightly oversimplified, but I think um, th that's a reasonable observation. Here I'm going to describe um, a direct attack on some, some actuators. I think in a sense, understand the side app model, this is attacking the actuators. So there were four um, tram derailments in a place called Lodz in, in, in Poland. And there was a, a teenager, a, a schoolboy, who modified a TV remote control um, to move points under the trains. And it turned out that the frequency that this remote control used um, actually was picked up and detected by um, the, the point um, machine. Um, you know, you know, he's viewed as being a good student, and apparently he actually wrote up what he did in his school notebook, you know. So it's a bit hard to say, no, it wasn't me, Gov, because he'd actually written out the evidence uh, of how he did it. Nobody was really hurt, fortunately. Um, a, a rather nastier example, um, there's a place called Maroochydore uh, in Queensland, um, in, in Australia. And here the attack was on um, the decision um, making, and you can see the, the plant um, on, on the left. But somebody um, attacked what's called a SCADA uh, system, uh, a supervisory control and data acquisition system. And the picture on the, on the right is the sort of system. I'm not sure what was actually used there. And he broke into this using um, wireless links. But actually, he used to work for the company um, after he was a consultant. And he didn't get a permanent job. So he was annoyed with them. But he knew how the system worked. And he, I think it took him 45 attempts to get in, but on the 45th attempt, he managed to open um, some sluice gates and so on. And there was about a million liters of sewage went into the local waterways. It didn't kill any people, but it killed a lot of local uh, wildlife and so on. So if I go back to my um, sense, understand, decide, act model, and think about um, security. Um, so one of the things I might do is actually I might go and modify the environment. And so this stop sign says, stop defacing stop signs. Now, these have been used in a number of, of cases. Remember correctly, this one turns into a flower pot, according to the machine learning um, algorithms. You know, to us, it's a stop sign that's defaced. But the algorithms are just generalizing for what they've been taught. Um, I can actually have a go at the sensors. I'm not sure how clear these are. But the top one of these is a, a, an ultrasonic uh, sensor from a car um, you know, detection 
uh, you know, detecting obstacles, but actually it's been damaged, so it probably will give misreading or misleading readings. The one on the bottom is a camera with some tape over it, so at best it will give you very fuzzy um, images, at worst it may miss things um, altogether. I can try to attack the understanding. Uh, my favorite philosopher, uh, Bertrand Russell, his book, An Inquiry into Meaning and Truth, the version I have, has this picture on the front. So he's saying, dog, although it's a cat inside his head. But actually, if you mistrained the model, so it always thinks cats are dogs, um, then you're going to get inappropriate behavior. Um, decision, um, I've illustrated with Marucci Dor, the attack on the decision making, and the system at Lodz in Poland, I've illustrated you know, direct attacks um, on the actuation systems. So from a, a security perspective, because you can attack anywhere, actually including the development process, we need to protect systems um, everywhere as, as well. So it, in many cases, um, security vulnerabilities can compromise safety and you know, the Lodz and Marucci door examples um, illustrate this. They say, well, actually, I've got to do something about security um, with, the, with the, also the benefit for safety. But safety doesn't always dominate. There are some cases. So, uh, for example, it might be um, that I decide to use um, wired rather than wireless um, communications, even though wires going through um, somewhere might trigger a, a fire. Because by doing that, I prevent um, attacks through the Wi-Fi, spoofing or, or jamming the networks. So in general, we need to be able to make and justify trade-offs. I think in time, what we might see is that these ideas of, of safety cases and ethical assurance cases expanding um, still further to deal with these sorts of issues and, and, and trade-offs. So um, a, a few words in conclusion. So I had robots you can rely on in the title. So to produce robots we can rely on, we need good models to help um, do the analysis. And these models have to be rich enough to be um, accurate and useful, but simple enough to use. And so things like SUDA, I think, are very helpful as a, as a hook for that. We need to adapt our analysis methods to deal with the, the technology, um, with machine learning, the complexity of the environment, and so on. And, and AMLAS, as I illustrated, is um, our way of doing that. We've got to consider the ethical issues that I've um, illustrated, you know, plus the transparency of the system so you can make reasonable arguments about those. And what we're hoping to get out of that is a basis for confidence that the robots will do the right thing and can be relied on. As well as I mentioned, you need to consider security and do this ideally within the same sort of framework so you can balance off these different factors. I've illustrated um, some of the issues, some of the approaches, but it's an ongoing um, challenge. Systems grow in complexity, grow in their usage, and you know, um, Paul uh, commented that you know uh, I've been running this program with some interest for a while. It's because these things are really interesting. They evolve over the uh, over time, and you're never done. Now, I, I'm going to conclude with um, one last video. Um, because you trust something doesn't mean you should do it. So I've, I've got one last video, and, and please don't try this at home. Right. Don't move. You're moving. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just the shake, he's got the shake. And this really is a knife. I don't know how sharp it is, but... It gets exciting in a moment. Um, okay, so now we're going to speed up, I think. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not going to stop that. That is the hit of the hand. I think it would. I think there would be a certain amount of blood or seven bits. Is... <laughs> 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 it's so, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I thought that would wake you up again if you'd fallen asleep through that. Um, I'm afraid I haven't left very much time for questions. Very happy to, to take questions if, uh, if there are any. So, ladies and gentlemen, over to you. Are there any questions? Uh, we'll run around with mics so the people online can hear us. So, uh, any questions for them? 
Paul? And then, I know Ian had one. Ian told me his question, it's too hard, you have to ask other people first. Um, thank you for the inspiring talk. Uh, I was wondering your opinion about these trade-offs between safety and security. So, do you think, um, can, we ha can we really automate the process of decision-making uh, of these trade-offs between safety and security? Uh, because you said, yeah, most of the time, security concern compromise safety issues. But there are some cases, for example, security is also related with privacy, and there might be cases um, safety and security are conflicting each other for some specific context. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Do you right. think, you, yeah, you... like a, a robot can decide um, between these trade-offs? Can we really automate this? I was just wondering you, you your opinion. Yeah, you certainly can end up with conflicts. And I don't think the robot's going to be making that decision. I think the designers are. I think it's too, too difficult to know how to program something that would actually make those choices. I think that's what the designers are going to have to do and to, to, to reason about. I mean, the, the problem with that is actually identifying you know, I enough um, of, of the circumstances to be able to make a, a good choice. But I think, I think that's what the designers um, have to do. So it comes back to, you know, human expertise and, and, and judging these, these trade-offs. But it, it, it's never simple. I mean, that's what systems engineers do all the time, but not perhaps as complicated as in these systems, because it's harder here to actually understand what the consequences are. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes, I know Ian, Ian had an awkward question for me. Ian? Uh, thank you. This is about the conflict between innovation and regulation. Yeah. And I was reading in yesterday in The Guardian, this was by somebody from the point of view of uh, health. Yeah. And uh, in using computers in health supporting devices. The argument goes that appropriate regulation is a must for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. The regulation will help get it installed in, and introduced. Yeah. Do you agree or is, is regulation a, a distraction against uh, innovation? No, I, 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 I do agree with that. I, I think it is essentially, in fact, the Assuring Autonomy Program is intended to focus on assurance and, and regulation and it's quite hard to work out what regulations you have. But, you know, over the you know, more recent times we've been starting to engage with regulators. I mean, I mean the the difficulty is to get that framework right. This technology moves very fast. So I think you have to be goal-oriented and say, here are some goals you need to achieve, things you need to demonstrate. That's why I think safety cases are potentially relevant. But I think we also need to modify our regulatory models um, to an extent. Typically, we've said, we can analyze something. We're confident it's safe. We can deploy it. And you do worry about safety through life, but there's a bit of a disconnect. I think now we're going to have much more of a continuum that says we think it's good enough to deploy, but we're going to keep monitoring, we keep observing, and we're going to feed back, and we may say, oh, whoops, actually we shouldn't have done that, and, and withdraw something and make much, much more, more rapid um, changes to the approval status of systems. I, th I think it's going to change. Real challenge for the regulators because they're not resourced to do that and they probably also um, don't all have enough expertise to be able to do it. But I think, I think regulation is essential um, to do this, but getting the regulatory frameworks right is, is a bit of a challenge. Do you imply dynamic regulation rather than static regulation? Um, so the question is, would you do dynamic regulation rather than static? I, I, think, I think it has to be dynamic to, to an extent, you know, more so than it is now. Quite that looks like I don't know. So we're trying to persuade the foundation to fund us for a few more years. Uh, one of the reasons is that we actually think need to look at um, things of that sort of nature. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's what's going to happen. It's going to have to be more dynamic than it, than it is now. Even without systems learning in service, if they learn in service, you have no hope but to do it dynamically. Okay, thanks. John, are you allowed to be awkward? And then, and then Philippa. Thank you for the, the talk. Um, you spoke about improvements in performance. Do you think there's the possibility or what's the perspectives for uh, runtime learning or safe runtime learning? I, so, you know, can you do safe runtime learning? Um, 
my view on that is um, twofold, a yes and a uh, probably not. Um, the yes is if you can design systems so that the learning is effectively optimization within an understood uh, safety uh, parameter, safety framework, then you probably can. If you're learning new behaviors, then you probably can't. As unless you can work out how to reevaluate the safety properties of the new functions as you go along, which effectively means completely automating the safety process. But I think it's very hard to do that. Now, there may be some special subcases um, where you can. So I think, so my view is where, where it's optimization, you're not intrinsically changing the function, you're just doing it better. You can. Where it's new functions, it's, it's very hard, if not impossible. To do so. Well, if you gave me enough money, um, <laughs> I wouldn't mind looking at that, but I, I, I think it's pretty hard. Okay, and th then Philippa on the row in front. Hi, thank, thank you, John. Um, as safety engineers, for traditional systems, we often fall back on what we call good practice, established yeah. methodologies, um, you know, verification techniques we know that work. However, with machine learning, we just don't have that at the moment, and the papers I read don't seem to be converging on anything. Yeah. How close do you think we are to establishing any kind of good practice for machine learning engineering? I, I think some of my colleagues might be able to better answer that than, than, than I would, although I won't, um, I won't finger them at, at this point. I, I think my honest view is we're quite a long way away from that. I mean, having this sort of good practice is, is cultural as much as technical. And I think in the safety world, the culture has been to say, oh, you know, here's um, you know, things we might do in this, wrong in this programming language. Let's actually uh, put in a set of rules that constrain you from using um, those sorts of constructs. Um, I don't really see a, a willingness to do that. But also the technology moves so fast, it, it, it's quite hard to know how you would actually write a, a set of precepts or guidelines that would give you good, good practice. So you know, I hope that will change. Um, I, I don't really see that. And if any of my, my colleagues uh, you know, have, have some better views on that, I'd be interested to hear. But I, I think we're quite a long way away from that. And I say it's as much cultural as, as, as technical. OK, Sarah? Thanks, John. So um, my question is perhaps a little bit related. Yeah. And I'm interested to know where the, where the challenges or barriers are. And what, what I mean is, is it in machine learning? Is it in how you write the software? Is it in some other part of the technology? What, what are the things that need to be solved to really make progress? Where, you know, where, where are the big challenges? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's a very broad. Um, question. Uh, I, I think the answer is really at, at, at two levels. One, we actually have to have um, a better understanding of the scope of what the system will do um, and its environment to end up with actually what's a realistic, what's a feasible um, concept for the system and a set of requirements. I shall come back to that in, in a moment. I think the other thing is we need a much better technical grasp on the machine learning element. So I've mentioned things like, um, you know, AMAS, which I think, you know, rightly is, is getting a lot of um, interest and acceptance in the industry. There's still, you know, and the framework is sound, there's still a number of things that we actually don't know, um, such as, you know, what depth of evidence is appropriate for a level of, of risk for a system, um, you know, how we do deal with um, changes in, in, in systems. I mean, you know, one of the things that I, I didn't mention is that sometimes when you retrain systems, they forget things they used to know. And there's an area of machine learning research called learning without forgetting. Um, for traditional safety engineer, you do so-called regression testing. Let me test it again to see if it still works. So things like this that we don't have um, good handles on. So I think this work needs to be done um, at, at that level. Back to the system level, 
Um, you know, the, the, the program has supported things, for example, like agricultural robotics. I think it's much more credible that we can deploy this sort of technology there. As the environment is less complicated, you can control it um, in, in some ways. Things tend to move rather more slowly. Um, there tends to be quite simple actions you can take to put the thing in a safe state, like stopping. Um, whereas if I'm flying at 35,000 feet, you know, stopping isn't a great option. I've got to fail operational to get the thing back on the ground. So uh, I, I think by scoping our ambition, um, we will help. And then actually by still you know, fundamentally looking at this interaction of safety and, and, and ML and, and moving the two communities forward together, I think will we'll make a difference. But yeah, so there's quite a bit left to do. I think, I think Ian had a question at the back and then maybe we should draw a close ball. But Ian? Oh, last, last but not least then. Uh, I'll ask a question about metrics, which when sat next to Tony is quite a brave one, but it's a different type of metrics. So the machine learning experts talk about things like root mean square error and average true positive rate and things like that. Uh, I, I would hazard a guess that they're not that applicable to safety. Have you thought about what might be useful metrics from a safety perspective to judge whether machine learning algorithm is, is any good? Um, I think the simple answer is, yeah, we look at that all the time, but it's, it's context dependent. You know, so if I'm um, you know, dealing with driving a car, I'm interested in um, you know, how far away the pedestrians are, the closer they are, um, the closer I'm to a decision point where I have to change my course of, uh, of action, the more important it is to have confidence in their position and the trajectory um, prediction. Um, so you end up with a set of requirements that, that are, you know, the, the root mean square may be fine, but actually it's actually very bad close to and it's very good a long way away. Um, isn't what you want, you want it the other way, way around. So yeah, you actually have to shape um, the, these metrics. I think that's one of the ways that the, you know, the safety world and the machine learning world need to, need to come to, together to see how to shape the, you know, those sorts of performance metrics um, that, that mean that you actually train safe behavior by using the standard machine learning um, methods. And you know, some PhD students and others who are working on exactly that sort of thing right, uh, uh, right, right now. So hopefully, Paul, that's a good place to end. That, that is a great place to end. So um, thank you, John. A, a really great talk and a, a really great end to our 50-year celebrations. Uh, so thanks. thank you again. Uh, thank, oh, you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.